Hi, in this video, we will continue to use MokuLab to demonstrate the principles of a lock-in amplifier. In part one, we introduced and discussed the concept of a heterodyne demodulation and the fundamental principle of a lock-in amplifier. In part two, we will discuss two important parameters of a lock-in, phase and filter bandwidth. Let's start with phase. In part one, we assumed that there was no phase difference between the signal and the local oscillator. But what if your input signal is not precisely in phase with the local oscillator? We can investigate this interactively with Moku Lab in a real system. Here, we will generate the local oscillator with the lock-in's internal clock. This allows us to interactively adjust the phase of the local oscillator and observe the effects. To set this up, we will operate the silver MOGU as a waveform generator to produce our input signal, and the black MOGU functions as the lock-in amplifier instrument. Connect the 10 MHz reference clocks between the MOGUs to ensure their internal clocks are synchronized. Then, connect the 1 kHz sine wave output to the lock-in amplifier's input. Now, take an iPad and launch the lock-in amplifier instrument Switch the local oscillator from external to internal. Then enable the probe point before the mixer. We want to ensure the input signal and the local oscillator are in phase. Now place a probe point at the lock-in output. The level, as you can see, is around 250 millivolts. Next, we adjust the phase of our local oscillator by swiping. We can clearly see as we increase the phase difference, the signal gets weaker and weaker. At 60 degrees, the signal is half of its original amplitude. Let's verify the math. We have our two sine waves at 1 kHz with a 60 degree difference in phase. After the multiplication and low pass filtering, the signal is scaled in amplitude by cosine 60 degree term, which equates to 1 half. So the math is consistent with our observations on the MOGU. Good. So, to get the optimal output amplitude, it's important to ensure that the signal and local oscillator are in phase with one another. However, this can be difficult in some applications. Also, this means that any instability in phase would directly translate into amplitude noise. To avoid the influence of phase instability, MOGU Lab's lock-in amplifier implements a technique called dual phase demodulation. Let's take a look at how this works. Instead of using a single mixer, dual phase demodulation splits the input signal into two paths and then feeds each one into different mixers. Both mixers operate at the local oscillator or LO frequency, but are 90 degrees out of phase with respect to one another. This allows the lock-in to simultaneously demodulate at two phases and get two outputs. Let's go over the math and then demonstrate this interactively with Moku Lab. We have our signal F1 and two LOs, F2 and F2 prime. We multiply them with the mixers and filter out the high frequency components. Now we get our X and Y at half and minus root three over two. This agrees well with the experimental results from Moku Lab. How does this dual phase demodulation help? Let's imagine we have a signal with amplitude R shown in this phasor plot. By multiplying the signal with cosine 60 and cosine 150, we effectively project the R onto the real and imaginary axes. The projections and the signal form a right angle triangle, as shown. The amplitude of R can be recovered by the square root of x squared plus y squared, and the phase angle can be recovered by the arctangent y over x. This agrees with our math and experimental measurements on Moku Lab. Moku Lab's lock in amplifier instrument implements dual phase demodulation. A simple tap switches between rectangular XY or polar R theta. In R theta mode, 
You can see the R is not affected by the phase difference between the LO and the input signal. And the theta can be used to directly monitor the phase shift of the input signal and the reference LO. To summarize, we have discussed dual phase demodulation and the effect of phase on the operation of the lock-in amplifier. This was easy to demonstrate with the interactive Moku Lab interface. Now, let's discuss the effect of filter bandwidth on the lock-in. Recall, the lock-in amplifier implements a low-pass filter immediately after the demodulation, and the corresponding time constant are related by this equation. The time constant is inversely proportional to the filter bandwidth. A narrower filter bandwidth provides better signal selectivity, therefore a better signal to noise ratio. However, it's not always appropriate to use a very narrow filter. If the signal itself covers a wide spectrum, a narrow filter may cut off certain amount of the signal itself, which means loss in signal integrity. Let's take an interactive look with Moku Lab. First, we connect the iPad interface to the silver Moku and launch the waveform generator. Turn on AM modulation and modulate the signal with a 10 Hz square wave. Then we connect to the black Moku and launch the lock-in amplifier instrument. Turning on the input probe, we can observe the 1 kHz signal modulated by the 10 kHz signal. Next, turn on the output probe. At a filter bandwidth of just 1 Hz, the square wave feature is completely filtered out. As we increase our filter bandwidth to 10 Hz, we start to see some signal. But since the higher frequencies are still filtered out, it doesn't resemble the original square wave. At 100 Hz, we can start to see the actual square wave features of our original signal. If we further increase the filter bandwidth, we can get sharper edges to the square wave. However, as it gets closer to the modulation frequency, we start to observe feed-through of second-order and higher harmonic components, which degrades the signal-to-noise and causes distortion. So, it's important to have an idea about the shape and feature of our input signal, then choose an appropriate filter bandwidth and modulation frequency. Thanks for watching our lock-in series videos. See you next time.